Good morning, everyone. We'll get started as it is 10 a.m. on the dot. Um, welcome. My name is Lauren Young. I'm the program manager at the Three R's Collaborative, um, and I'm very excited to be hosting um, our workshop today on neuromuscular and fibrosis MPS, along with David from the IQ MPS. So before we jump into presentations for the day, I'm just going to begin with um, a quick overview of the Three R's Collaborative MPS initiative, as well as um, some information and reminders for uh, this workshop today. So first, just a quick disclaimer, this webinar and workshop series is made up of companies who may be competitors or customers of one another. Accordingly, nothing discussed during these webinars and workshops are intended to result in an agreement on price, exclude suppliers from any market, or otherwise restrain competition. Those participating in this webinar and workshop series are instructed to avoid discussion of competitively sensitive subjects, including costs, prices, sales, marketing, and other confidential information. In addition, neither the 3RC nor the IQ will use contact information received during this collaboration for marketing purposes or engage in marketing or sales conduct during collaboration activities. So just first, a quick introduction to the 3RC and this webinar series. Um, the 3Rs Collaborative MPS initiative has the goal of collaborating to accelerate adoption of MPS in scientific research. And we do this by having a diverse uh, collaborative nature. So the three R's collaborative members span across the scientific field, um, and you can see our leadership and board members here. And our initiative seeks to increase adoption and regulatory acceptance of MPS in coordination with animal studies. And as you can appreciate, um, we have a very diverse group, uh, 44 institutions, um, our members, 35 of which are developers, along with end users and regulatory bodies. And we have a few aims. One, to provide thought leadership and expert consensus. Two, to facilitate appropriate discussion, collaboration, and sharing. Three, to create direct engagement between developers and regulatory agencies. Four, to develop external partnerships and collaborations. And finally, to facilitate um, and create resources to increase engagement across the field. And we accomplish this through our three main work streams, our regulatory, our technology expo, and our end user and education. So I'll just briefly review some of our major outputs from each of these initiatives that are really exciting and those upcoming. So we're engaging consistently with end users and providing education. And this started in 2021 when we established an MOU with the IQ MPS and hosted our first webinar. We continued these webinars as well as participation at many different workshops and um, conferences in 2022 as well as 2023, um, and we conducted our first full year of quarterly webinar workshops. And we're continuing this into 2024, as well as joining Altex as a member um, and continuing talks at the World Summit in SOT. And you can see all of our past webinar series presentations on our presentation page, as well as they're now available at the events tab on our website. In terms of our regulatory group, um, again in 2021, began with drafting publications on an overview of MPS and regulatory acceptance, and continued this work in 2022, um, along with discussions with regulatory bodies like the FDA. Um, in 2023, um, we continued with our um, publication, getting consensus and focus on this, as well as a consortium with FDA and CEDAR. Um, and we're continuing this um, as well as into 2024 with a cross-platform DILI project. Um, and finally, you can visit our Technology Hub Expo, um, which I'll put the link into the chat soon. Um, but this allows you to filter technologies by tissue, disease area, as well as non-human species. Um, and this was launched in 2021, which we're continuing development um, up to this day. 
So now for just some final information, we do have our last two um, upcoming workshops in this 2024 series um, in September as well as November. So stay tuned for more information on those. As well as um, some information on the workshop today, you can leave questions for presenters in the Q&A box and they'll be answered after the presentation time permitting. And if not, um, we will have a final Q&A at the very end with all presenters. So feel free to email me. My email's here if you have any questions, concerns, or are interested in joining our MPS initiative. And now I will turn it over to David from the IQ MPS. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Kukla, um, and I am part of the IQ MPS affiliate, um, specifically serving on the strategic partnerships and communications team. Um, so I just wanted to give a little background on the IQ MPS. Um, but if you have kind of want more information on it or questions, you can visit our website that I added in the lower left corner, the IQMPS.org. So to give a little background, the IQ MPS is currently composed of 26 member companies uh, with representations um, all across um, with drug safety, uh, three R's, um, ADME, as well as PDPK experts. And our current leadership team is made up of Anya Kopek, uh, Rhiannon David, um, Kim Homan, as well as Rhiannon Hardwick. And uh, besides the leadership team, uh, we also have a steering committee, and this is made up of two individuals from each of our 26 member companies. And then to the right, um, just to highlight a little bit more on the IQMPS, uh, we do have over 115 active participants between these companies, uh, which meet several times throughout the year. Um, additionally, uh, the IQ has published um, three publications and is currently working on several more. Um, also, uh, we established a LinkedIn page uh, not so long ago, so feel free to follow us there uh, to kind of keep up with um, news from the IQ MPS. Uh, so we have four main goals as part of the IQ. Um, one, to serve as a thought leader for both MPS stakeholders um, and developers um, in the industry and impl uh, through implementation and qualification of MPS models. Also to provide a venue for appropriate cross pharma collaboration and data sharing to facilitate industry implementation and qualification of MPS models. Also to create focused engagement between industry and regulatory agencies on the current status um, and evolving field of MPS, as well as develop external partnerships and collaborations to help advance um, enhance the inclusion of industry priorities. So the IQ MPS is made up of five affiliate work streams, uh, one being the organo, uh, organotypic manuscripts team, uh, where the goal is to publish manuscripts outlining organ specific industry requirements for MPS platforms. Um, also, one of our work streams is regulatory outreach, uh, which identifies opportunities to engage with help, uh, health authorities globally on topics related to MPS qualification. Uh, additionally, we have the pilot projects team, and this team initiates uh, near term proof of concept studies uh, for data sharing or prospective co collaborations for qualifying MPS systems based on specific COUs. Um, additionally, there's the strategic partnerships and communications team, uh, which communicates industry perspectives and builds relationships with key MPS stakeholders. Um, and then finally, we also have the landscape gap survey team which conducts and analyzes surveys, um, benchmarking how pharmaceutical companies are currently using MPS models. So here's just a quick overview of our external partnerships over the past few years, uh, starting back in 2018. Um, however, we do have several other activities uh, within cross pharma collaboration, uh, within data sharing and uh, regulatory agency engagement, um, as well as thought leadership. Uh, but some highlights from the external partnerships team, um, as Laura mentioned before, in 2021, we co-partnered with the Three Arts Collaborative and established an MOU, which allowed us to work together on these webinars. And then in 2002 and 23, uh, within the with the Three Arts Collaborative, uh, we had four webinars, 
each year on different MPS systems, uh, such as neuro, um, liver, blood-brain barrier, uh, vascular, and GI. And then within 2024, um, in addition to this webinar and one previous webinar um, this year on immune models, uh, we have two more webinars planned for the year uh, that Lauren already highlighted um, for those dates. Um, additionally, we recently participated in an IQMPS FDA workshop uh, where we discussed the use and interest of animal MPS. Um, but overall, we're really excited to continue these efforts throughout the rest of the year and upcoming years. Um, but if you have any questions on the IQMPS, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or check out our website listed below. I'm Jacob Fleming. Um, I'm a research science security buyer. Um, I'm here to talk about one of our new models. It's a project that I'm leading. One of our internal R&D projects is to create a model of the neuromuscular junction uh, based on our existing Manta Ray technology, which is uh, I will introduce and is a technology for measuring the contractile output of striated muscle. And I'll give you a bit of an intro to Curie and what we do, <clears throat> our existing instruments. Now I'm going to focus on one application of the neuromuscular junction model, which is um, for use as a potency assay for botulinum neurotoxins. And this is supported by uh, the NIH and FDA. It's been a direct call out from them. And I think it highlights some interesting um other applications around potency for these models that goes beyond some of the classic things we think about when we think of mps models in preclinical development and disease modeling so curie bios <clears throat> a small company out in seattle there's about 40 of us and we began building 3d biosystems we call them but it essentially means consumables and hardware um for creating microphysiological systems and what we found is that although the models themselves are successful in our hands when it comes to selling them to people the feedback is well what cells we put in them <clears throat> and then once you've got the cells working how do we analyze the data that comes back and actually sometimes in this contractile data the waveforms and things can be non-trivial to analyze and get quantifiable metrics from and so the business expanded really to support a broader range of applications to bring together all the components needed for these systems as opposed to just selling uh, the microphysiological systems. Um, and really the uptake as you would expect is probably broadly through discovery and disease modeling. This is where we see most of the interest, but like I said, I think today I'm going to focus a little bit on this efficacy and potency testing. And this is an area that's growing, I think, in our minds. And especially as gene therapies for things like uh, muscular dystrophy grow and that's you know a world that we're um, very much interested in and we'd love to see progress there because of the applications in skeletal muscle a great deal of those therapies rely on complex biologics where potency testing is going to be a routine challenge for uh, these drugs when they hit the market and so the use of the nmj model that i'm going to describe for potency for botulinum toxins, which already is an on-market drug with a known potency system, so something to compare against, potentially is a really interesting uh, canary in the coal mine, as it were, for MPS systems for potency. So the technology that this NMJ model is based around is the manta ray system. <clears throat> it may well be familiar to a lot of people. It's based around a tried and tested two-post system. You take your cells and mix them with fiber and hydrogel and plate them into this casting mold and it creates a tissue between these two posts the cells within the hydrogel remodel that tissue create axial tension this aligns the myo tubes in the case of skeletal muscle and in the case of cardiac muscle which also works in the platform uh, the cardiomyocytes are aligned some tension builds and then we will see that tissue either beating in the taste of cardiac tissue or in <clears throat> skeletal tissue in the response to electrical stimulation will see contraction. The unique feature here though in the mantra is that within one of the posts is a magnet and that post is flexible and underneath the plate is a magnetometer. As the magnet within the post moves the magnetic field changes and the magnetometer picks this up. The instrument assesses that change and converts it into a waveform. And this allows you to do all 24 wells in parallel and in real time without going in and 
disturbing the tissue at all. So it's non-invasive parallel measurements of all 24 well plate uh, tissues on the plate. <clears throat> and this here in the top right is just what those tissues look like. And like I said, with the cardiac tissue, it will beat spontaneously. But with the skeletal tissue, um, we need to drive that contraction in some way. So for skeletal only tissues, we use electrical stimulation. This is the literature standard and it works really well. So we have these stimulus that drop into the plate and the carbon electrodes sit either side of the tissue. Um, and we can drive you know, different frequencies, um, different time periods, and we have a software suite that controls this, allows individual application of stimulation protocols to all the different wells, if you would like. Um, and it's been really great. We see physiological, uh, we see phenotypic differences in disease. Uh, we see drug responses. It certainly works. There's no question about that. But in vivo, broad field electrical, stim electrical stim is not what drives muscle contraction. We want to really extend our biology beyond <clears throat> um, that simple um, and rather crude method of driving contraction. And that's really where the interest for the NMJ project lies. Can we bring that contractile activation closer to in vivo? And so the second stimulus that's important here is this one on the right, which is the blue light stimulation lid. It uses laser diodes to focus a highly intense spot of blue light on the tissues. And the reason this is important is that the motor neurons I'm going to talk about today express uh, channel rhodopsin which is blue light sensitive. So by applying blue light to code cultures of motor neurons and skeletal muscle, we can specifically activate just the motor neurons. And any function <clears throat> that res results from blue light exposure, we can say is neural driven function as opposed to um, just non-specific contraction of the underlying skeletal muscle. <clears throat> So those that might not be familiar with the NMJ, this is its setup. And one thing I wanted to highlight is it's a complex 3D structure, and it also relies not just upon the cells involved. And there's a cell type that I'm not going to talk about at all, which is Schwann cells, and um, also a fundamentally important cell type of the NMJ. But they lay down matrix in addition to the cells. And this is a true 3D structure, really. Uh, you get these invaginations of the postsynaptic membrane tight sealing of the intersynaptic um, inter space um, at the edges. And in because of this complex organization, our belief is that 3D systems like this are probably going to be um, the endpoint for these types of models, because we need to build that complexity. And often it takes a great deal of time to build that complexity too. And for skeletal muscle, um, we often find in 2D systems that as time goes on, it begins to peel from the surface. And so that can be a real challenge. Um, and so there's obvious applications here in the in the diseases that spring to mind, ALS, SMA, myasthenia gravis. But um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to touch on our, our botulinum toxin work um, and why, why we're doing that. So botulinum toxins have this relatively complex mechanism. They're taken up through the presynaptic membrane, activated in the lysosome. The light chain escapes into this intracellular space and cleaves, depending upon the serotype of the toxin, various parts of the uh, snare complex. <clears throat> the toxin most people are familiar with is toxin A. It cleaves SNAP25 on the, um, of the snare complex. And there are actually some cell-based models that can assay its potency based upon um, the cleaving of SNAP25, but one of the challenges is that especially uh, for the FDA, and this is one of the reasons they've asked for it, in cases for food poisoning, for example, where they have an unknown toxin complex or an unknown composition of complexes, they need a non-specific assay, something that allows them to assay all of the seven different serotypes um, without prior knowledge of of what it is. And so those cell-based assays uh, are not suitable for that. So can we build a true NMJ that's functional, apply the, boat, um, the toxins to it, and watch function drop away? <clears throat> so the way we've gone about this is we take our mature skeletal tissues, we make them as we always have, and they're functional between the two posts. <clears throat> and at the same time, we create neurospheres, 
within this custom consumer model we've made. And you can see we get this array of 100 neurospheres laid on the bottom. We then let them mature for 10 days and we overlay it with a second hydrogel and neuronal hydrogel. We plunge the existing tissue into that neuronal hydrogel and we use that almost like a glue. And we adhere those higher neurospheres without moving them at all to that mature skeletal tissue to create the co-culture. And we then maintain that in a co-culture medium that retains skeletal function and drives axonal extension. You can see this bottom image here, the red arrows are highlighting the neurospheres and you can see the tissue, the skeletal tissue uh, in between. And this has allowed us to load very consistently large numbers of neurospheres and create a even distribution of those neurospheres across the tissue to improve our chances of getting robust innovation. And once we've let this mature, because these neurons are blue light sensitive, here we see the application of blue light should drive muscle contraction downstream. <clears throat> this in situ neurosphere creation and adhesion has been one of the kind of key steps forward. These models exist in literature. There's no question about it. We've seen a few of them before, but the ease of use has been a real challenge and how robust the response is has been a real challenge too. Can you res get a response to every single tissue every single time? Um, and so without um, this array of neurospheres and this ability to innovate large areas of the tissue, our feeling is that that's been the main challenge uh, today. So what do these look like from a functional point of view? Well, here's a raw trace from a single tissue, but it's pretty representative. We're hitting it with blue light, as you can see with these small bars, and we get clear responses and response to that blue light application. <laughs> our uh, existing peak finding algorithms and data processing software allows us to actually extract quantifiable metrics from this so we can quantify the force they produce. We can quantify whether they respond every time or whether they respond only a percentage of the time. What we find is that at lower frequencies, they absolutely respond every time, and this is really robust. At the higher frequencies, this loss in um, percentage response is actually the beginning of something that looks like fused tetanus. So as opposed to not responding, they simply are already responding. And then the other thing we can assay is a comparison between the blue light response and the response to electrical stimulation. The electrical stimulation should evoke maximal uh, response from the muscle tissue. So what percentage of that can be reached through innovation? It gives us some proxy um, of percentage innovation of that individual tissue. So you can see how these metrics, especially, for example, in something like ALS, where we see reduced fidelity of transmission and reduction in percentage of the muscle innovated could be really useful uh, in this type of model. When we apply botulinum toxin, we see complete loss of function at these higher doses, and we get a really nice dose response curve. And so this is the foundation of that potency model that we're suggesting. And um, we're going to have to build this out, obviously, and compare it to the existing models, which is the mouse, which is a lethal mouse assay, <clears throat> to compare how our values um, stand up against that. But fundamentally, a dose response to this toxin a proves that a potency assay is possible, and b says to us that this response we're seeing from blue light is specific to the NMGA. We're not driving a non-specific interaction here, um, and so that's a the really important feature. We can take some histology too and prove that we think these are specific. <clears throat> what you're seeing here is the neurons in red, the muscle uh, in green, and then the acetylcholine receptors in white. And so these areas highlighted in the white arrows, a co-localization of all three in a single place. Again, highlighting the specific nature of the interaction and something that looks like an NMJ. <clears throat> And the final piece there I'm going to show you in the last couple of minutes is off our calcium imaging platform. <clears throat> the rationale here really is that the existing models have used a lot of calcium imaging uh, as a proxy of function in some ways. Um, but we'd like to show equivalence to those models and like to show that we can also uh, see that spontaneous calcium flux that a great deal of literature has reported. We're using the NOAFLY system, which is another one of our biosystems. I'm not going to go into great detail, but it's a high throughput calcium imager. What's interesting for us on the NMJ project is that it has a wild field, wild, uh, wide field of view. 
And so we can assay the whole tissue at once and break it up into different compartments. And so when we do that, we see control tissues show very little calcium flux, whereas NMJ tissues, when they're broken up, show these areas of spontaneous activity. Um, and we're just beginning to explore how we could use that and what we could do with it. Uh, so that's it for me. That's a quick intro, a bit of a uh, run through of the data we've got and um, what we're thinking of doing with it. So the potency assay is probably leading the charge, but we have our eye on ALS as well as a clear disease application. And then there's definitely interest in can we drive additional maturity as innovation hits skeletal muscle. We know that's a key event in skeletal development. Okay. I think we're Probably haven't got time for questions. I've seen Lauren pop up, but yeah, thanks, Jacob. Yeah, so I'm the chief scientist and co-founder with Mike Schuler of Hespros. We've been around for about eight years. I'm also a professor at University of Central Florida. Just a really quick view overview of Hespros. Um, we've licensed about 20 patents from Cornell and UCF. We had won the Lush Prize for Alternative to Animals. Um, we use a lot of uh, SBIR funding to get. Um, the company uh, to be robust and profitable. We work with folks all over the world. We got a 14,000 square foot facility down here in Orlando. We got about 50 people at the company. We are CRO. We've always only ever been a CRO. Um, we figure that's the best way to uh, with these systems. And also, I'll give, just give you a little um, um, example of we had the first microphysiological system where our efficacy data um, was utilized for a successful IND. They led to the authorization of a phase two clinical trial for rare disease CIDP, um, which actually has phase two has been successful and is translated now into a phase three, basically showing that these models are have regular not only have regulatory acceptance, but also they're clinically predictive. Um, and why is that? Is because we work on this idea of clinically relevant functional readouts. So again, you go into a doctor's office, he doesn't immediately stick a needle in your arm, look at biomarkers. How are you walking? How are you talking? Are you making sense? He listens to your heart. He checks your muscles. He asks you about elimination. What he's really doing is check on muscle contraction, electroactivity of neurons and cardiac cells, um, neuromuscular junction information, which we'll talk about here, but also barrier integrity, which allows us not invasively to monitor for acute, but more importantly, chronic uh, uh, evaluation of these systems, but without cell death. We're really not looking at death markers in these systems. We're looking at cessation of function without cell death. So what we can do, we can put thin layers of uh, cardiac or skeletal muscle on silicate, on thin layers of silicon, um, basically so when they contract, they bend, they deflect the laser, we can get force. We can measure, uh, put pattern cardiomyocytes over top of microelectrodes, okay, and get the um, conduction velocity QT interval from that. Um, we can also uh, do the same thing as for skeletal muscle. We have a wide variety of uh, peripheral nervous systems and central nervous systems where we can look at function. We can still look at biomarkers. All right, so again, the idea of clinically relevant functional readouts. So we're trying to do this, but without cell death. So we can assemble them, put a fluidic path on top of it. Um, we have then a recirculating serum-free media. Everything I'm showing you is all in serum-free media. I banned the use of serum in my lab a long time ago. We can put a clear top on it. So all the imaging um, devices people have come up with, we can utilize in these systems. We can also take out, say, one chip and put in another. We can also, we have utilized organoids in these systems. So they're very uh, flexible and reconfigurable. So the neuromuscular junction model is a two-chamber device where what we can do, we can put uh, motor neurons on one side, grow axons through the tunnels to innervate muscle on the other side. This basically shows we can either put the um, myotubes on cantilevers to be able to get the force, or we can do motion capture in this side. We can stimulate the motor neurons on one side, grow axons through the tunnels, make nice neuromuscular junctions. The really nice thing about this is we can treat a compound either on the muscle side or on the motor side, motor neuron side, or both. So you get an idea of you know, where the application is. We published the first dose response curve for um, Botox in biomaterials in 2018. Um, I've been working in the area of neuromuscular junction for close to 20 years. Uh, we just won a $2 million direct to phase two SBIR grant from NIH to develop a high throughput aspect of our NMJ. We expect to have that um, available very soon 
uh, for the community for Botox evaluation. We can also look at uh, disease models. We've been able to differentiate out multiple SOD1 lines, um, FUS, TDP43, NC9, motor neurons, muscle, and swan cells. And again, same idea. We can basically put the diseased cells in the, um, the chambers. We can actually then monitor function in these models. Um, we can look and see uh, uh, deficits is reversed. And again, sticking with this whole idea of clinically relevant functional readouts, we had worked with somebody who's running an AS, ALS clinical trial at Mass General, Brian Wanniger. Um, and I asked him, what are some of the tests you have uh, a patient do to evaluate their functions? Is one thing they have them do is a, a task with their hands faster and faster. And what they do, they start developing jitters and they lose grip strength. So, and so we can actually reproduce that. We can stimulate the motor neurons faster and faster. And if we see skipping here, that's akin to the jitters. And if we see loss of tetanus, that's akin to loss of uh, grip strength. Um, so direct correlations to what you would monitor clinically. It's a very busy slide, um, published in advanced therapeutics. Basically showing again for wild type, you get great fidelity, good tetanus. For two SOD1 mutations, you get um, some skipping, partial loss of tetanus, full loss of tetanus with the other, with a fuss mutation. You can also see, again, some skipping, loss of tetanus. In this particular case, we had wild type muscle on the other side. So we can actually then prove that the, the deficit is at the neuromuscular junction because we get great fidelity and tetanus on the uh, muscle side. And again, you see um, statistically relevant changes in that. And again, we can also look at fatigue index. Again, a car, uh, something right out of a clinical trial, uh, this equation where we can monitor tetanus, show it goes up, okay, um, with the mutations. Uh, we've been able to take this system and then take the um, round robin with the wild type, wild type, uh, wild type skeletal muscle, motor neuron SOD1, uh, skeletal muscle SOD1, uh, wild type, and then both mutations. And again, you see the morphology is fine in these systems. We're not killing the cells. This was published in biomaterials. And the results showed basically not only do we get deficits with the motor neurons, but also with the muscle. And then you see um, even a higher deficit with this one mutation, okay, which is the um, L144P. But for a, the E100G, you see a lesser phenotype in terms of the muscle, okay, in the combined system. And you see that get better with time. Um, so we have a way of looking at these ALS systems long, longitudinally and also cell specifically. Um, and one project we did with Apellus, they, uh, we took our bipartite as a control, and then we added microglia to the motor neuron side, and then Schwann cells, neither unactivated uh, monocytes or activated monocytes on the muscle side. You can clearly see, and what they're looking at is their drug pig cytocopin. Um, we added in complement sera into the system and basically showed that the in unactivated monocytes, you get some deficit, but their molecule was able to reverse that to some degree. But in the activated monocytes, you see a very large deficit, but actually restoration of function. With fatigue index in the unactivated monocytes, you don't see much effect. In the activated monocytes, you see a statistically significant effect at the higher concentration. And again, Biogen just got their drug approved by looking at neurofilament light quantification. So we can, again, look at the biomarkers in parallel and show that we get, again, a biomarker reduction in our clinically relevant functional systems. We've also looked at myasthenia gravis in this. What you have with myasthenia gravis, you either get blocking of these acetylcholine receptors, um, you get internalization or complement deposition. We did the first dose response curve for an antibody in this system a number of years ago. Um, and again, you see antibodies not against the acetylcholine don't have uh, any, any function. Um, what we really wanted to do was to look at this idea of a loss on the outside of the re uh, receptors of the outside of the cells versus internalization. So we saw if you look at with, with, without triton and with triton, um, basically that gives us access to the inside of the cell. You can see here that we get the same amount of receptors inside and outside. You see that reduced with the low concentration of an antibody to acetylcholine, and then you see down regulation in higher concentrations. And this was published in Frontiers in Cell and Developmental Biology. We've also done a recent project on sarcot marie tooth disease. Um, the CMT2S mutation is a rare variant of this rare disease. What we did is we took fibroblasts from a patient, turned them into stem cells, 
differentiated them out into motor neurons and to muscle. You see here that the the markers are correct um, for the um, the motor neuron differenti differentiation, and we did not see much fidelity change. But, but again, unlike ALS with a CMT patient, they don't get those jitters, but they do see loss of grip strength. And what we do see is that uh, statistically relevant over the entire day of the experiment, you're seeing a higher fatigue index, but you're also seeing a, a very strange um, fatigue index in terms of this is what it is with wild type, this is what it is with the um, CMT. And if you look at um, uh, the control, we're actually then looking at a uh, antisense oligonucleotide, you see actually then um, tetanus is sort of chaotic in these systems. So you can see here where you get loss of um, strength, but not, not a total loss. But you can also see where this chaotic is. As you we're looking at single myotube innervation, if you take a bundle of them, you can see at some point where all these deficits will line up and suddenly you'll get a muscle fail and they'll fall, which is another characteristic of CMT. We showed that in this particular patient, you know, again, really, um, um, you know, looking at uh, personalized medicine, um, you get restoration of the, the tetanus in the system with the ASO. And this is actually in clinical trials with this one patient right now. Um, just wanted to, again, um, highlight this idea that we looked at CA, uh, CADP. We created a conduction velocity model where we turn the NMJ model 90 degrees. We go the axons through the tunnels, the neighbor conduction velocity. This was the data, again, used um, for the IND where they had the untreated. You see the signals. You see for the control untreated. You see the uh, variety of frequencies abolished with the isotype control with the serum, but their molecule was able to retain that. This was published with Sanofi and Advanced Therapeutics. And as I said, this is now proceeded as after a successful phase two trial into a phase three trial. Um, and then lastly, we also have fibrotic, fibrotic models. Um, we can put these in these multi-organ systems. Again, it's the first system Mike published on multi-organ design back in the late 1990s. This is one of our more advanced systems where we can look at a five-organ system. We utilize a pumpless platform and get rid of all the tubing and all the pumps and everything. We use gravity to pump the systems. Um, and this is actually a liver cover. Now these are just hepatocytes where we show we can actually culture them in 2D out the 28 days and 3D out the 28 days, all in serum-free media. We can maintain SIP activity for 28 days, okay, for both basal and induced. This is published in Biotechnology Progress. But what we can do, we can then selectively add in stellate and kufr cells in this case, you want to show matinib does not show any deficits. Diclofenac does is known to deliver toxin, but it's actually affecting more the stellate and the kufr cells than the hepatocytes. So we have that ability to selectively look at the different cells in this serum free media. We can also induce fibrosis by taking a hepatocyte stellate co-culture, uh, co look um, TGF beta and CTGF, and again in, induce um, stellate. Uh, fibrosis formation in these systems. Then lastly, last slide, just show we can also create pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic models of these systems to be able to predict in vivo outcomes for dosing and, um, uh, and pharmacodynamics. And that is my uh, presentation. Uh, if we have time for questions, happy to entertain them. Uh, I'm Roberta Visone. I'm R&D science leader in Biomimics, and I'm really happy to be here today showing uh, Biomimics solution to model fibrosis. Just a quick uh, overview on uh, Biomimics Vision that uh, provide uh, biotech and pharma company with uh, advanced tools that allows them to discover the therapies of tomorrow uh, by starting from human data, which are already available today in uh, uh, this microsystem. In particular, we provide human preclinical models, which really reflects the clinical complexity of the patient, so to design effective treatments. How do we do this? We started thinking about the organs in the body and uh, uh, we realized that every tissue in the body is subject to motion. If we think about it, uh, in the lungs we breathe, uh, the heart beat, and the gut has a peristalsis movement, and the cells in human tissue are always surrounded by a three-dimensional microenvironment. 
So we came up with our beating organs on chip, which is a novel approach that combine microfluidic, uh, live human cells and physical stimulation to really create a testable three-dimensional model. And we can do this thanks to our UBIT patented technology embedded in a platform. Here you can see uh, in the video a um, functional unit of uh, the platform and in the cross section you should imagine that we can culture cells in 3D, here represented in blue, between two rows of hanging posts which separate the macro tissue from lateral median channel. And by providing uh, actuation in a bottom compartment we can move a membrane which transfer then the movement to the macro tissue. And thanks to the versatility of the platform we can operate it in different configuration. We can for example uh, uh, produce macro tissue in the central part of the chamber and we can, thanks to geometrical features, uh, stimulate them by means of compression or stretching. But we can also take advantages from the lateral media channel and we um, can form a barrier-like structure. Or we can play again with the geometry and uh, we can develop flanked micro tissue which can be subjected to different kinds of mechanical stimulation. We already use our device to produce a different organs model and we have now different qualified application, both from physiological micro tissue or pathological. And today I will show you uh, an example of uh, cardiac fibrosis. Cardiac fibrosis is a maladaptive remodeling of the myocardium and is characterized by a contraction impairment of the tissue with an excessive extracellular metric deposition. One of the main players is cardiac fibroblasts, which are activated and transformed into myofibroblasts and produce these excessive metrics. Fibroblasts are triggered uh, by means of profibrotic uh, chemokines such as the TGF beta, but also um, from mechanical stresses. And we start uh, from this hypothesis that mechanical stresses, even in the absence of profibrotic chemical stimulation, can act as a key player in activating cardiac fibroblasts. And that's the hypothesis at the base of our uh, uh, model of cardiac fibrosis, which is called USCAR. So we started from healthy human atrial cardiac fibroblasts. We embedded the cells into fibrin gel and we inoculated into our beating organs on chip. And we provide the cells with the three-dimensional mechanical stimulation, uh, mimicking uh, the beating like uh, uh, stretching. So we provide to cells a uniaxial strain of 10% with a frequency of 1 Hz. We use uh, uh, static uh, micro tissue as control and uh, static micro tissue addition with TGF beta, which is a gold standard to produce cardiac fibrosis in vitro, as positive control. And we also assess the combination of both chemical and uh, uh, mechanical stimulation. We assess, first of all, the cell phenotype switch by means of immunofluorescent staining. And here you can appreciate uh, the myofibroblast stain by means of alpha smooth muscle actinin. And uh, we could demonstrate that the mechanical stimulation alone or in combination with the TGF beta allows to increase the alpha SMA positive cells within respect to both static control or static micro tissue culture with the chemokine. Not only this, but we could also assess the uh, ACM deposition. Here in the monofluorescent staining, you can see the representative images of fibronectin. And we could demonstrate again that mechanical stimulation uh, alone increased uh, the um, deposition of both fibronectin and collagen within respect to the static control. And most of all, that the combination of uh, the two uh, stimulation statistically increase uh, this parameter within respect to the static control, meaning that we could reproduce some of the health mark of the pathology in our model. After verifying that, we started validating our model for drug efficacy studies. The first context of use was was the efficacy of uh, antifibrotic compounds uh, to prevent fibrotic traits, and we demonstrate for two commercially available drugs. Uh, so first of all, uh, we generate uh, uh, our three-dimensional model within our platform and then we subject the cells to a three-dimensional mechanical stimulation in the present or in the absence of the drug. And we could demonstrate that, for example, pyrfinidone, which is uh, an antifibrotic drug uh, um, used to treat uh, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, decreases uh, the number of alpha SMA positive cells within respect to the micro tissue where mechanical stimulation was applied and also drastically decrease uh, the collagen type 1 and fibronectin content, both uh, really in respect to the mechanically stimulated macro tissue and also uh, from static control. 
The second context of use that uh, we wanted to investigate is uh, the efficacy of advanced therapeutics. And uh, uh, in particular, we use a gene therapy, which was uh, uh, provided from our collaborator from Politecnico di Torino. And uh, this gene therapy is a combination of microRNA, called MIRCOMB, that uh, allows to direct reprogram cardiac fibroblasts into cardiomyocytes. In particular, our collaborator already demonstrated the efficacy of the therapy in reprogramming cardiac fibroblasts into cardiomyocytes like cells in static culture. Indeed, after 15 days in static petri dishes, the cells show an enhanced cardiomyocyte related marker expression, such as cardiac troponin T and cardiac troponin I, while a decrease in cardiac fibroblast related markers, such as Vimenting and DDR2. So we investigated the effect of this therapy in preventing fibrotic traits on our model. So uh, we started by transfecting the cells into D, and then uh, we cultured the cells for seven days uh, in uh, a static condition inside our device, and then we apply for an additional seven days a three-dimensional mechanical stimulation. Here we can see that uh, um, in a static condition, the MIR combo uh, was uh, uh, able to reprogram the cells. Indeed, uh, we have an announcement uh, of uh, cardiotroponin T and uh, myosin light chain 7 uh, uh, expression. But when the mechanical stimulation was applied, these two parameters decreased. And uh, instead, the um, expression of collagen 1, which is the marker of cardiac fibrosis, increases. And the results were confirmed at protein level. So the MIRCOMBO in static condition was able to increase the alpha sarcomeric actin positive cells within respect to the static control. But when the mechanical stimulation was applied, this level again drops. And uh, instead, the collagen content was again increased, meaning that uh, the MIRCOMBO efficacy was impaired by means of the mechanical stimulation. We then went a little bit further and uh, we assess uh, the capacity of the therapy to revert uh, fibrosis uh, in the model. So first of all, uh, we develop a fibrotic model in the chip, uh, taking uh, advantages from the mechanical stimulation. And then uh, we directly um, provide uh, the MIRCOMBO therapy in uh, 3D. And then we culture uh, the cells uh, again uh, inside the chip for uh, an additional 15 days. As you can see from the immunofluorescent staining, the MIRCOMBO in dynamic condition was able to reduce uh, the alpha SMA positive uh, cell number that are triggered in dynamic uh, condition and also decrease the content of collagen type 1, both in case of static or dynamic micro tissue where the therapy was not, not provided. However, uh, by assessing the cell reprogramming, we could see that the mechanical stimulation decreased uh, the uh, level of uh, uh, cardiac troponin T and the myosin light chain expression that was triggered by MIRCOMBO in static condition, and that uh, uh, bring the level back as uh, it was in the static and non-treated controls. And again, at protein level, we could demonstrate that the mechanical stimulation decreased the uh, sarcomeric actin in positive cells within respect to the therapy uh, when it was administered in static condition. So uh, again, the therapy seems to um, limit the fibrotic traits uh, uh, acquired by the model uh, in the dynamic condition, but was not able anymore to reprogram the cells uh, from cardiac fibroblast to cardiomyocytes. Just to summarize uh, this part, uh, so our use care model is able to recapitulate the health mark of cardiac fibrosis uh, by using uh, only mechanical stress, and this allows to avoid the use of TGF beta, which may cross talk with antifibrotic target. USCAR was confirmed also to be effective for efficacy screening, and the peculiar use of pifinidone test highlighted the possibility uh, to use uh, our model also for uh, drug uh, repositioning. And not only this, but by exploiting uh, this complex model, it was um, clear and it was elucidated that innovative advanced therapies that were found to be effective in 2D or a simple uh, 3D miniaturized model was not effective. And 
anymore when the mechanical stimulation was applied. And this is really relevant uh, because it's really important to uh, really uh, provide a relevant hallmark of a pathology to uh, really profile uh, the efficacy of therapies. And we are now, uh, now going a little bit more deep into the characterization and modeling of cardiofibrosis by assessing the contribution of cardiomyocytes and other kinds of cells, such as endothelial and immune cells, thanks to a granted Marie Curie uh, project. And uh, for the sake of time, I will not go into detail, but we are uh, um, using a similar approach also to uh, model lung fibrosis and in particular to model idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a disease that uh, causes scarring and enhanced stiffness of the lung. And despite the fact that the causes are not still fully elucidating, we know that both epithelial layer and uh, fibroblasts contribute to the pathology. So by taking advantage from uh, our versat the versatility of our platform that uh, allows us to form three-dimensional micro tissue, but also barrier-like structure, we want now to apply a similar approach to model uh, the stromal compartment of the lung, meaning uh, uh, using a fibroblast and the epithelial barrier. And if you're interested in the preliminary data that we obtain, you can always contact us and we will be really happy to show you the preliminary data. And uh, uh, to conclude, uh, uh, based on the model that I show you today, uh, I would like to say that Biomimics provides services to screen uh, compounds and advanced uh, therapeutic efficacy. And we're also open to discuss uh, in case uh, you want uh, uh, to test uh, the setup in house uh, under evaluation agreement. And with this, I would like to thank uh, uh, all the members of the Biomimex team, our collaborator from Politecnico di Milano at the Mimic Lab and uh, from Politecnico di Torino. And thank you all for uh, the attention and I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, Roberta. Um, it looks like we have one question in the Q&A. Um, so, Roberta, why is stretch more relevant than TGFB? So, um, it's like not a kind of, uh, it's more important than another, but it's another mean that to us is fundamental to trigger fibrotic traits. And in this case, if we can use, for example, mechanical cues to trigger fibrotic traits, and we have, for example, uh, uh, to test molecules that interact with the TGF beta pathway, we are sure that we are not uh, um, create any bias in our model, because we know that sometimes that to um trigger fibrotic traits in the model, we need to uh, have a very high dosage of uh, this uh, uh, TGF beta, which is not uh, uh, physiologically uh, linked. And so having another mean for us, it's really fundamental to better test uh, therapeutics. Great, thank you. Um, someone is wondering, are these cells from donors? So these are uh, um, commercially available uh, primary cells. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and I think we could do one more question. Um, regarding the static and dynamic conditions, which one more represents human body conditions and drug effects in clinic? So uh, that's really the idea that we have behind when we started uh, uh, developing the model. So, for example, I will take the example of the advanced therapeutics. So the Mircombo that is used to directly reprogram cardiac fibroblasts into cardiomyocytes. What's relevant for us is to really mimic what happened in the body. So if you think about this kind of therapy, which are meant to be used directly in patients to transform cardiac fibroblasts activated into cardiomyocytes is fund fundamental to reproduce this hallmark in um, the model so to have a more realistic response of the compound. So that's the idea behind the model. Great. Thank you so much, Roberta. Thank you very much for inviting me to present. Um, as you know, my name is Oliver Cully. I'm a senior scientist at CM Bio, and we're actually based in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Um, today I'm going to talk you through our physiomimic system and our NASH assay in particular, um, which stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Um, one second. Right, 
so um, as I said, you know, um, I'm here at CM Bio. We're talking about organ on a chip. Um, I'll introduce the system. Nash is also referred to as metabolic dysfunction associated steatohepatitis. So I use the sort of terms um, interchangeably, but short for Nash or MASH. Um, I'll talk a bit about the therapeutic landscape and then um, about our NASH model and some anti-NASH therapeutics. Um, so just to begin with a brief overview, um, much like you know many of the OSCs that have been described today, um, we're seeding um, primary human cells into our system. We can also seed cell lines, commercial models, iPSCs or tissue slices. Um, we have you know, cells seeded onto these scaffolds. So on the right, you have a schematic. The cells form these tissues once seeded upon these scaffolds. And these scaffolds, much like a tissue culture plate, will sit in wells within the plate itself. And then we have this cycling, um, cycling cell growth media, and that's to mimic blood flow, but it um, provides nutrients, gas exchange, as well as shear stress. Um, this is what our actual system looks like. So you've got your controller, you've got your plates within um, a dock, and then you've got your docking station. And then we offer various different um, plate types, but this one in particular is our dual organ model. So you're able to look at um, organs um, in unison and it makes use of interconnected flow between our compartments. We have our barrier model, so um, looking at gut and, and lung in particular, which has a basolateral flow. And then much of my talk today will focus on the liver model. So this is called our liver 12 plate and it's got 12 independent wells and um, uses uh, micro tissue perfusion. And we tend to use, um, I guess, all of these for safety toxicology, ADME, and um, in this case, fibrosis and disease modeling or NASH. Um, if you then sort of zoom into the plate as it were, you've got the um, the scaffold onto which hepatocytes are seeded, um, and then you've got the direction of flow of the media itself, and that's enabled by these micro pumps and then reservoirs and capillaries. And we can see that with time, you see your hepatocytes onto the onto the scaffold. Um, you've got sort of tissue formation within these pores within the scaffold, and that develops over time from day zero, where you're on four hours, all the way to day seven, and you have this tissue, particularly within the pore, which is of interest. And then with that, you see typical um, markers of cell health. So we, we are able to stay in for tight junctions, which are highlighted with these arrows. You've got bar can canaliculi, and you've got production of albumin, which is what you'd expect from your liver cells, as well as cytoskeletal markers as well. So a bit of a background on NASH itself, um, a bit of a jump there, but as I said, NASH and MASH are interchangeable. You have with your healthy liver um, in, you know, in with exposure to fatty acids and metabolic syndrome, uh, propensity to shift towards non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If left unchecked, that can um, develop into NASH and then even further into cirrhosis and um, liver cancer. It is possible to reverse this. And this slide's really just talking about um, in vitro tools in which to test anti-NASH compounds um, and how and how they need to behave. So with your preclinical in vitro tools, they need to be human relevant. They need to inform your animal studies, um, look at mechanistic insights into NASH, and then um, express a wide range of human translational biomarkers, informing decisions on yes or no for your anti-NASH compounds. So this, this, this diagram is actually um, from 2022, so it's from this Red Hoco paper. Um, and it's looking at different um, therapeutics at that time. And there's obviously lots listed in this diagram and they're affecting different sort of pathways. So you've got lipogenesis, bile acid metabolism, fibrogenesis, glucose metabolism, and then metabolic regulation. And so it's quite a diverse sort of portfolio. Um, there's obviously, as we all know, dropout of these drugs from clinical trials. And so with a lot of um, the successes that we do have, you see a lot of failures too. Earlier on this year, you had um, Madrigal Pharmaceuticals Resmeteron, which is here on the diagram, um, approved um, for tr for treatment of NASH. Um, but despite you know, despite these successes, 
more work needs to be um, done to sort of test long term efficacy um, and safety of these drugs. And that's where our organ on a chip models come in. And then this is um, taken from a, an, another paper in 2022, but it's showing your sort of drop off um, or time taken at least to go from target validation all the way through to approval to launch. Um, and part of the reason why um, NASH is is hard to sort of um, model or hard to treat at least is that you have slow disease progression um, and, and and lack of um, easily measurable surrogate endpoints. There's variability within um, how people describe um, an endpoint itself, so histological endpoints for approval of drugs. And then you have a lack of preclinical tools um, that model the human disease. Uh, providing mechanistic insight for drug developers and you can just see the cost and time associated with this here 10 to 15 years and then you're sort of two two billion per um, new medicine so coming back from our previous um, slide which looked at liver um, formation we have our nash assay itself so you've got your liver on a chip plate um, we have a contract research team which do a lot of our cell validation so these are human um, primary cells we seed um, in cold culture, hepatocytes, kupfer cells, so your immune light cells, and then stellate cells. So these are sort of your ECM remodeling cells. And then over the course of 14 days, you're feeding these cells with a high fat diet. Um, and it, you're able to see this NASH phenotype from day four, and your readouts are liver functionality, steato steatosis, or um, sort of lipid accumulation, fibrosis, and inflammation. Um, and so this is um, some of our some of our data you know, indicating how the how the experiment works, but you've got markers of um, stellates in this panel here and you've got alpha sumacitin and collagen, which, you know, um, others on this on this workshop have discussed. And then you've got an increase in macrophage markers. I should have said as I started this slide that um, low NPS M NPC is describing non parenchymal cells or hepatocytes alone. So you've got low um, MPCs or you've got high MPCs, in which case you've got your triple culture and high levels of cupfrous and stellates alongside your hepatocytes. So you can see with, with inclusion of these cells, you have increases in stellate markers and you have increases in macrophage markers. Looking at fat consumption or FFA, um, free fatty acid consumption, you have an increase in um, you have an increase in FFA consumed with hepatocytes only in fat media compared to lean media and then comparing NASH and steatosis so your NASH model which has all three cell types in your steatosis which doesn't you see similar fat consumption by your hepatocytes and this can be shown with your NAR red staining and this here is your sort of your pore within your scaffold itself and you see lipid droplet accumulation over the course of the experiment. We can then look at different um, sort of markers. So you've got your inflammatory cytokines, you've got your IL-6 and your TNF-alpha, and then you've got um, sort of fibrosis biomarkers like TIMP1 and Procollagen-1. And then there's an increase in inflammatory cytokines with time in your, in your NASH model or your NASH phenotype. And then this is just comparing your NASH with your um, hepatocyte only. So you have an increase in NASH of your um, biomarkers of interest compared to hepatocytes alone. And then when we take our NASH, um, our NASH media or our, our NASH model, if you add TGF beta, you sort of stress that phenotype more and you can see an increase in um, protein expression of your collagen alpha one and uh, collagen type one and your alpha sumacilactin. And that's at the sort of immune cell uh, it's in your um, ICC imaging. And then you've also got soluble markers. So this is an allies and you see increased expression with TGF beta and NASH combined. And then here we're looking at relevance of this. So at the transcriptomic level, you're comparing our NASH model with the human gene atlas. And you can see that there's um, similarities there. When you look at the Gs, so differentially expressed genes, there's a greater overlap in NASH compared to murine models with our patient data sets and then looking at um, NASH versus uh, Western diet fed um, murine NASH and human NASH, which is uh, fibrosis stage one and two, you have close association between the 
the MPS and the and the human NASH patients themselves. And then just sort of bringing this um, to a close, I'm going to present some data on anti-NASH compounds. So these are all um, in late stage clinical trials, but you've got your um, efficacy screening of anti-NASH compounds and then your translational biomarkers. Um, and then you're looking at, you know, fold change versus your vehicle control. And you can see that there's a decrease in, in fold change of your markers of interest with each of these anti-NASH compounds. So not only do we have a, a, a model that works nicely, but you've, you're able to show efficacy of your, of your drugs of interest. And this can be seen quite clearly in this ICC in that your vehicle control has all of your markers so it has now red which is your steatosis alpha smooth oscillatin and collagen type one which is your fibrosis and there's a drop off in signal between your control and your other um anti-nash compounds and then we've quantified this here so compared to your vehicle control there's a reduction in collagen um collagen staining and there's a reduction in now red staining as well and so i'd like to just sort of summarize by um saying so hopefully today I've demonstrated the capabilities of our system, um, use of translational biomarkers for informed decision making, we have deeper mechanistic insights with high content data, you're able to gain a greater understanding of the human specific responses and then it allows sensitive prediction of anti-NASH compounds in terms of their efficacy as well. So with that I would like to um, wrap up and thank everybody for their attention and for listening. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions now. And of course, all of this work is supported um, by the great team that we have here at CM Bio as well. Um, so besides albumin, which specific markers are you using for staining the liver cells? Uh, so we tend to stain with albumin, but we tend to do a lot of our work um, with ELISAs. So the system itself allows for a lot of media within the wells. And you can sample that media on various days along your time course or along your experiment. So we tend to look at um, albumin and SIP for cell health. And then we look at um, LDH and um, sort of ALT, AST for cell damage. And a lot of our work, I've sh obviously shown the sort of NASH and the fibrosis, but we do a lot on DILI as well. So drug induced liver injury. And you're looking at how different concentrations of compounds affect your cell viability. And then here, you know, you've got fibrosis, so it tends to be typical markers like collagen and alpha C muscle lactin and, you know, your ECMs, and you can stain for those, but you can also do various sort of ELISAs. And then some of the work that I'm doing now is, you know, looking at gene expression and qPCR as well alongside. Great. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today to be um, uh, presenting um, at this forum. Uh, and um, thank you again, Lauren and NA3CRs for the invitation to do so. Um, I serve as the Chief Scientific Officer for um, Inspiro. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a, um, we are, oops, I lost my presentation. Right. For those of you who don't know us, we are a company of um, Zurich, um, Schlieren and Zurich, and we specialize in, in our uh, 3D Insight Spheroid platform. And I think um, Oliver really very nicely sort of laid the foundation for what I'm going to do a lot of talking about, which is um, that being able to balance uh, physiological relevance with throughput. Um, for us, we have um, a diverse platform, and I'll go into it for a little bit before going into our fibrosis models. But really, in terms of spheroids, our focus really is on reproducibility and the robustness of these models. Um, they are sim simplistic, more simplistic than organ on a chip models, where we really work towards balancing throughput and complex physiology. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, our aim really is to generate data that is robust and reproducible in different laboratories around the world by, while being equally predictive as more complex models. Um, I'll go into that a little bit later into how we feed into the ecosystem of more uh, complex validation models. Uh, all of our models are very compatible with high throughput screening and automation, so they're very good for primary and confirmatory screens uh, to build a 
blueprint of phenotype, so to speak. Um, the applications for most of our models range from anything from mechanism of action studies to predictive and investigative docs, things that I will not be touching on today, but also preclinical biomarker assessment with translatability to clinical relevance. Um, and again, as with most spheroid models, we do have a reasonable amount of flexibility in building um, the kinds of models depending on the disease area that you're looking to uh, work with. So as I mentioned earlier on, um, 3D Insight, our 3D Insight platform is really the best balance of throughput with physiological relevance. Um, so depending on what your biological question is and where in the discovery process you are, you might choose to work with a model that's more scalable and automation compatible that can give you more information in higher throughput, but perhaps lower complexity, and then can generate data for predictive algorithms, or you can move into um, uh, move further into the ecosystems of uh, non-animal methods and, and go into validation models based on information that you get from a screening system that's very uh, throughput and automation compatible. So our system here at Insphero really is a focus on delivering this reproducible data for you and on operational scalability. And this flexible, scalable, and reproducible 3D Insight Sphero platform really allows for the precise definition of the context of use of a particular assay in the evaluation of multiple indications. A few of these which are described here, as I mentioned earlier on, not only um, do we function in the liver space where we have a liver disease model for metabolic dysfunction associated steatohepatitis, which I'll be talking about today with respect to fibrosis, but also for predictive and investigative talks. We have an islet discovery group, again, functioning in that metabolic disorder um, arena. And then we have um, a robust oncology and immuno-oncology portfolio as well. But today I'll be focusing uh, primarily on our MASH model using human live and spheroids. And then uh, with a little bit of time, I'll uh, give you a brief insight into a new uh, collaborative partnership that we have with Genome Biologics, where we are investigating fibrosis um, in, in cardiac organelles. Um, so our liver spheroid model is used for a wide application. So we, as I mentioned earlier on, it's it's USB really is that it's um, automation compatible. Uh, we can, it's it's very uh, compatible with being able to get multiple readouts. So whether you're looking at microscopy, whether you're looking at transcriptomics profiles or biochemical readouts, uh, we're able to multiplex all of this in the liver model. We use, we do a lot of um, investigative and predictive talks um, in our liver safety and daily assay group. But uh, the focus of today is, um, so the data that I'll be showing you is from our disease modeling uh, for MASH, uh, where we look at um, uh, the ability of, um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, are not only to be reproducible and robust, but also to be clinically translatable. So I would say from our disease modeling perspective, um, the two main things that we sort of really want to focus on is the reproducibility of the data, and then how clinically translatable are these in vitro endpoints? And um, as I mentioned, um, you know, from a from a mash perspective, you know, you could look at steatosis, you could look at inflammation and fibrosis. Today's talk is focused on sort of our fibrotic endpoints collagen, um, histology, and then um, something that we, um, a, a program that we embarked on with PharmaNAS to develop an AI-enabled algorithm to really look at the in vitro endpoints and how they correlate with um, in vivo disease relevant endpoints. So as um, some of you may know, there is, there has been with, with the approval of resmituron, there's there is a race for approval for MASH drugs, but it has left us with significant failures because pr primarily because there is a severe dearth of um, preclinical models that are human translatable. And what so whether you're in phase one through phase three, there are there's severe attrition at each going from one phase for another, going from one phase to another. Ir irrespective of what the mechanism of action of the drug really is. So here you have sort of the, 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 the prime, uh, you know, you're, you're positioned to really build a model that can answer many unmet clinical needs. And so you have an unmet clinical need for the disease itself. The, there is a need because of the failure of current models to, to accurately recapitulate the human 
And then um, the other part that I'll touch upon um, reasonably extensively is the fact that it's a multifactorial disease. And then this goes back to the, the need to use models like spheroid models where you can look at multiple different aspects of a disease by, by being able to look at multiple endpoints in a robust and reproducible manner to be able to come to um, uh, an answer about the disease physiology. So our um, um, our models here at Inspiro are more are, are predictive, uh, uncertain in vivo uh, outcomes. They reproduce cellular interactions because of their 3D environment. They're automated and compatible for high throughput screening. And be, because of the fact that they're sort of um, in 96 or 3D4 well plates, we are also able to do uh, combination treatments over a period of time. So, um, give, Given that we, you know, we've we've talked a lot about the scalability of the model, what exactly is the robust and scalable multicellular model for MASH? So we do use um, single donors or pool donors, depending on the question at hand. I won't be talking about any of the single donor data today, but we do, um, especially for MASH, we have looked at um, uh, the role of SNPs in in uh, therapeutic resistance and sensitivity. Uh, we do have a uh, 3D inside human liver microtissue that it comprises um, primary human hepatocytes, liver endothelial cells, CUFA cells, and stellate cells. So that is our base model. And then over a period of 10 days, using a cocktail of free fatty acids and glucose, we're able to um, stimulate MASH, and then phenotypically characterize this based on whether we want to see steatosis, lipid um, accumulation, or fibrosis. Um, for the disease modeling itself, this particular as this particular model is really amenable to all sorts of pharmacological treatments. So it is uh, modality agnostics. We, we we've tested. Um, antibodies, small molecules, ASOs, siRNAs, and AAVs in this model. Um, it is very compatible with many biochemical and cellular markers, as you can see here. So we have biochemical endpoints where we look at, especially for fibrosis, triglycerides, glucose upward, glycogen. Uh, we have multiple immune uh, endpoints, and then we are also able to do a lot of immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence with cellular markers. Um, the, the data that I'll be sort of showing you um, for fibrosis is based on our histology data and how that correlated with um, an algorithm developed by PharmaNest. For our lipid accumulation, we do a lot of high content microscopy. Then we do a lot of transcriptomics for mechanism of action. And as I mentioned earlier on, um, this is a this is a, a model that's very compatible with therapeutic screening, both in a high throughput and medium throughput manner. Um, so uh, the our healthy liver, which we then sort of uh, use multiple cocktails to induce multiple disease models. You can get either steatosis, insulin resistance, inflammation, or fibrosis. And then we look at uh, primarily for the fibrosis, we look for reversal of the phenotype uh, back to uh, the lean model in, in various stages. Um, for one of the um, projects that we sort of developed with uh, PharmaNest, this PharmaNest um, uh, developed an algorithm called FibroNest. And the idea really here was to marry both of our interests with being able to develop a human relevant, uh, physiologically relevant uh, model for MASH, and then marry that really with in vivo relevant clinical endpoints. Um, so what PharmaNest did was based on clinical um, tissue samples um, that they had uh, accumulated. Um, they did an extensive analysis and came up with 217 parameters across different um, physiology. So whether you were looking at morphology across the board or were you, you were looking at specific morphologies to do with the collagen deposition, or you were looking at collagen content or the architecture of the tissue itself, they came up with 217 parameters from the clinical tissue specimens that they looked at. And then we looked at the fibrosis quantification using these clinical markers and then the um, um, the 
in vitro assays that we had. So the spheroid Nash model that you see here, that's the um, in vitro 3D model that we have. And then you have the human Nash samples in the blue circle at the bottom on the left. And we found that between the two, we had 97 quantifi quantifiable fibrosis traits between the Nash model and the uh, the clinical Nash samples that um, Fibronest had um, analyzed. And uh, I think one of the biggest take homes for us is that really understanding that the spheroid Nash model cannot be directly associated to a specific human Nash stage number. And, and this becomes important because uh, when you're when you're doing multiple control compounds, some of them will work for certain readouts and some of them do not show um, what you would expect to see in a human being. But this is where we're sort of staging what aspects of the 3D spheroid model are then used to predict a human outcome and which one of them is more predictive on an in vitro outcome. So for us, uh, being able to look at then delve really into these 97 quantifiable um, uh, fibrosis traits um, to then do some more transcriptomic analysis and then see which uh, which stages of fibrosis uh, they were associated with. And that's work that's actually ongoing right now. Some of it was uh, published recently and then the second paper is also, you know, um, getting wrapped up. But what we what we really um, have What's been really eye-opening for us has been how you're able to take the phenotypes and associate them with different F2 or F3 clinical stages for change values. Um, this is an example of what we see with uh, resmeritron, where we saw a reduction in fibrosis in human liver spheroids, which were measured with fibroness. So basically, we looked at um, the architecture of the fine, um, fine fibers, which you can see in magenta here, and then the assembled fibers in blue, and then their response to Fulcrostat. Um, in fact, um, outside, in, in addition to what we've done with Fibronas, we've also looked at pro-collagen um, um, and collagen markers for fibrosis. And uh, our 3D model has been um, used by multiple different companies um, in both in sort of the screening uh, discovery space, but also in the validation phase. And you can, as you can see over here, um, uh, some of the, the compounds that have gone into clinical trials have been tested and, and prioritized based on how they performed in this match model. Uh, we actually also have, um, in January, initiated what we call a MASH call, and here we're really leading the MASH market by providing a solution for candidate selection to do IMD-enabling studies. So we've taken our regular model and then um, um, sort of prioritize certain readouts for fibrosis. We have two screening campaigns a year. The idea being that anything that comes up as um, a, a promising molecule or a promising modality in a MASH call can then be taken um, into much more um, extensive analysis with transcriptomics and, and other um, fibrotic and steatotic endpoints for efficacy. And as I mentioned earlier on, I think since we are so dedicated to really understanding the idea, the in vitro to in vivo patient relevant translation of our fibrosis, not only have we invested heavily in, in our MASH model, as I just sort of mentioned to you right now, we've also looked at, uh, we're also working now with a company called Genome Biologics on their cardiac portfolio, and we also have an ocular fibrosis model as well, which I would not be touching upon today. Uh, but in terms of sort of the cardiac fibrosis, I'll be talking about um, heart failure due to a, a reduced perfusion fraction. Um, the current state with cardiac in vitro testing is that you do have the use of scalable 2D physiologically relevant models that inform on some but not all the aspects of in vivo translatable cardiac phenotypes. Um, and so what that leaves, will, leaves us really with is a gap that we have to fill, and we do this with a platform of scalable and physiologically relevant cardiac in vitro models spanning safety pharmacology and in vivo relevant surrogate endpoints for the alleviation of certain cardiac disease phenotypes. And I'll be talking to you today, as I mentioned, um, briefly touching upon HFBEF. Uh, with cardiac models, really, there is a tremendous patient and disease heterogeneity, and then you know, which is why you need a, a robust and scalable platform to um, um, 
deliver on multiplex endpoints to be able to really interrogate the therapeutic um, efficiency of a candidate. And as I um, uh, also said earlier on, um, we really specialize in high dimensional readouts. Um, our cardiac uh, platform is no different. We're really able to maximize the amount of information that's available to you from well to self for sort of broad and deep data sets for machine learning. Our current model portfolio for cardiac uh, disease biology spans everything from inflammation and my myocarditis to anthracycline cardiotoxicity, diabetic cardiomyopathy, and then um, uh, cardiomy uh, cardiomyopathy, including KSS. I will not be touching upon all of these, but um, sort of suffice it to say that all of these have an aspect that um, Sort of, uh, feed into their disease pathology. Uh, and we have models set up for all of these. What I'll be talking, sort of touching, touching upon towards the end of this talk today really is um, our uh, platform for um, uh, HFPEF, which is which affects about 50% of patients, really, this heart failure due to a reduced perfusion um, um, of fraction. Uh, it affects the left ventricle uh, for most patients, and it's something that's extremely difficult to catch um, uh, ahead of time. But in this in vitro cardiac organoid model, we're able to catch it beautifully. And what you can see here in our true cardiac model on the left is you have fib fibrosis induced by, uh, as you can see, um, uh, in, in, induced in the model itself. And you can see as you can see over here, you have the markers for fibrosis. But what is really um, sort of striking really is the reversal of this fibrosis that you're seeing with the addition of an antifibrotic agent across all the different markers. And this data from this in vitro true guardian model very accurately reflects what you see in the right, where you see patient data again, um, fibrosis and the frequency in of fibrosis in myocardial biopsies for HFBEF patients. And then as you can see over here, the difference between the non-myeloid um, HFPEF and, the, and, and regular HFPEF, which um, is translatable back to what we see in the in vitro model. Um, having sort of gone through both the MASH and the cardiac fibrosis model, I think what I'd like to end with really is that um, Within a Spheroid platform, we really focus on the development and co-development of disease-specific models that are able to serve the community when it comes to screening and validation of therapeutic candidates. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, all of our models are used for developing functional endpoints for disease biology, but also for biomarker-driven endpoints for translation into the clinic. Um, and with that, I believe I'm probably at time, so um, thank you for your attention. So I'm Vincent van Dijne. I'm a scientific project lead at Mimetas. And I'm involved in the, uh, the internal R&D research on uh, liver disease models. And today I'll talk about uh, recapitulating the liver sinusoid physiology for uh, liver fibrosis modeling. So I think my previous speakers already gave a really good introduction about the, the field of liver fibrosis. Um, so um, in general, uh, metabolic dysfunction associated with hepatitis, as it's now called MASH, affects quite a large uh, large part of the population and there's a large uh, risk, risk in incre large increase in, in, in mortality as soon as the, the fibrosis uh, starts to increase. Um, so therefore there's a reduction in fibrosis needed to increase to decrease the disease burden. Um, and now that that one of the uh, mesh drugs got approved, I think it will be a really interesting time to see what uh, what other pathways will be involved in in the in the progression of mesh. And hopefully more, more drugs and more targets will, uh, will become available soon. Um, <clears throat> so also at Mimetas, yeah, what we're trying to do is really basically bridge the, gap, bridge the gap between throughput and complexity. As mentioned by the previous speaker, um, yeah, there, I think uh, SphereArch is, is, is a nice uh, balance between, uh, between complexity and, uh, and ease of use. What we at Mimetas try to do is, is further increase uh, the physiological relevance um, 
by increasing the complexity a bit more. Um, and also how I see my quick cell code is basically having more defined control over where you put your cells and how you stratify your cell cultures. Um, but what we still like to do is, is have enough, uh, enough throughput uh, and especially focus on reproducibility because I think that's a major strength of the, of the platforms and still have the ease of use uh, as you would have with, with 2D cell culture systems. So for those that are not familiar with the Mimeters Organoplate platform, um, so what we develop at Bimetas is basically different configurations of microfilic channels, and these channels are then integrated underneath a 3D4 wells plate. Um, and then by, by using the 3D4 wells plate flat platform, it allows you to use any standard liquid handler, uh, any uh, high content microscope, uh, but also for some assets we do use, uh, we, we do use plate readers. Um, at Bimetas, we also develop our own custom equipment as well. So as you can see here in the right bottom corner, what we have there is a, a transendothelial electrical resistance device or a tear device to measure on some of the models to measure the uh, electrical resistance of the tubular, tubular structures. I also have a nice animation for you to, uh, uh, to see um, what this platform looks like. So this is again the Trader for Wealth platform. And what you're seeing is a, a individual chip. And depending on the geometry uh, and design of these, these chips, we have uh, from 64 up to 96 different uh, individually addressable chips. Um, how we typically describe our, our system is that we have uh, perfusion channels in which we can perfuse cell culture media uh, through this channel. Uh, we have gel channels in which we can uh, load a uh, extracellular matrix uh, into these channels. And important to know is that these channels are separated by what we call phase guides. And these phase guides prevent the flowing from a loaded ECM into the adjacent channel. So that really allows us to, to structure and stratify uh, cell culture systems. So what we do is we have, uh, so like I said, ECM channel, and in this case, two, uh, uh, two perfusion channels on the upper side. In between, we have these small ridges uh, what we call phase guides and like i said the whole system is uh, compatible with automation and liquid handler um, so we load a ecm in the center channel then this ecm polymerizes we can add uh, cell culture media we can add cells in adjacent channels and this allows us to build uh, to build tissue models in a really uh, um, stratified and sequential way then to apply perfusion to the system, we try to avoid to use any uh, pump setups. And so therefore we uh, typically use a rocket platform as shown here. And then by adding cell culture media to the wells of the GD4 wells play platform, we're able to simultaneously perfuse all the uh, chips that are present in the platform. And that allows us to uh, perfuse, this, perfuse the cell culture system to apply perfusion. Um, and it really helps to, uh, uh, yeah, to have a uh, robust way of, uh, of developing the, the cultures in this platform. So today I will talk about uh, the efforts that we've been doing on uh, liver disease modeling and, and uh, uh, specifically on, on liver fibrosis. So what we do uh, at Bimetas is we try to, to, to focus on uh, recapitulating the liver sinusoidal structure. So to do that, we make use of what we call the organoplate graft. Uh, this is a typical design in which we have a quite a large ECM or, or gel surface area uh, or, or gel volume. Again, adjacent by two perfusion channels. And what we do is we take um, cells from the liver so we can derive those cells from, from primary liver tissue. We mix those cells inside an ECM. And then in the perfusion channels that are adjacent to this ECM, we put endothelial cells. Uh, and this culture then develops into a fully uh, 3D culture. So then over time you see that the endothelial cells that are embedded in the ECM will develop into vascular structures. And then over time this whole system becomes also perfusible because you do get a connection with the vessel that develop in the center. They start to connect to the cells, to the, to the channels that are adjacent to, these, uh, to the ECM. Uh, and that allows us to create a fully perfusible uh, 3D cell culture model. So um, this is what was um, what we got when we started to, to work with the non-parenchymal cells from the liver. So as you might know, the non-parenchymal cells are, are everything except the hepatocytes. That so here is a mixture of liver endothelial cells, liver stellate cells, and maybe some immune cells there as well. And when we embed this into the into the ECM, what you can see there is that these cells are able to reorganize and restructure into 
what sort of resembles the liver slang struggle space. Um, and then here on the right, what you can see is a, a cross section of this, uh, what of the, the the culture that is uh, located here in the middle. And what you can see is that you have really perfusible, accessible lumen in this uh, in this structure. So this this got us really excited that by just um, taking cells that are derived from a primary tissue, it's able to self-organize into structures that do resemble the, the liver sinusoidal uh, structure. Then one step further, uh, of course, is adding the hepatocytes to this culture. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, so we basically set up a, a similar uh, similar culture of, of embedding all the cells inside an ECM, but then again uh, in uh, with the addition of hepatocytes. And what you're now seeing here in the middle is a what we call the triculture. So we have uh, liver stellate cells, liver endothelial cells, and uh, hepatocytes. And this again self-organized into uh, yeah really dense tissue that really resembles uh, the liver sinusoidal uh, space. And then here on the top right, what you can see here is, for instance, the, the staining that we do with uh, live one. So we take that as a, a marker for liver sinusoidal and endothelial cells. And there you can see that we can really form a complex, uh, fully uh, developed uh, vascular networks. Um, and then if you do a staining with, uh, for instance, um, with MRP2, uh, we can really show that the, the hepatocytes that are uh, residing between these vascular structures are already starting to polarize as well. So we recreate a, basically you get um, uh, apical to basal polarization of your hepatocytes with on one side the vascular uh, space and on one side the, uh, the space that forms the, the Balkan nuclei. <clears throat> Um, one thing to, to, to notice as well is that, uh, of course, we can uh, characterize the culture using different staining. So what you can see here is a, a albumin staining. We can do CD31 or LIFE1, as I just uh, showed you. Um, <clears throat> but what really what really got us excited uh, was when we uh, took a when we do confocal imaging, the vascular structures that we are seeing are really uh, um, uh, resembling uh, liver tissue, as you would see in vivo. And the, the vascular spaces that do develop between these, these hepatocytes are actually have a diameter close to, I would say, 20 to 30 micrometer, which is really uh, representative of what we're seeing, uh, what we're seeing in vivo. So here's a cross section uh, of the of uh, of the tissue, uh, and really, if you look at the, at the single cell level, what you can see is that, of course, you have hepatocytes lying uh, lying over here. Um, you have here CD31, you have the antidote cells really lining as a, as a monolayer, um, so they form really the, the tubular structures. And then in between are residing these stellate cells. And these stellate cells are really in close contact with, uh, with the liver and the tidal cells, as would also happen in, in the human body as well. So this is, of course, still all, uh, I would say, uh, not really disease modeling, of course, but uh, but just uh, uh, liver tissue generating something that resembles liver tissue. So the next step was to uh, to study if we can if we can use this also for uh, uh, for liver fibrosis. Um, one part is that is of course important for liver fibrosis is the inclusion of immune cells or tissue resident macrophages. So again, here what you're seeing here is a, a lumen structure of, of liver sinusoidal and endothelial cells. Adjacent are stellate cells, and then also in close proximity are the hepatocytes. But we're also able to integrate uh, uh, resident macrophages as well. So as you can see here in this image, um, you have hepatocytes on one side, you have liver uh, sinusoidal and endothelial cells on one side, and then integrated are also uh, macrophages as well. So then we have, I think, all the, the cells present that, uh, that we need. And uh, then we started to explore whether we can also use uh, use these models for uh, fibrosis modeling. So what you're seeing here is a, a basically an overview of the different readouts that we do and uh, a small representation of a, of a small screen that we performed on this uh, on this fibrosis model. So like others mentioned before, uh, we also use the, the alpha smooth muscle acting as a marker for uh, um, for stellate cell activation. So we're able to nicely induce alpha SMA, but also reduce it, reduce it if we start to inhibit uh, inhibit uh, fibrosis. Um, then on the right you can see um, um, a, just an a, a overview of what we what we get if we do RNA sequencing. We're able to do a bulk RNA sequencing, but we're also able to extract extract the cells again from the culture to do single cell uh, RNA sequencing as well. So that's something we're currently exploring. 
Um, and because we have highly reproducible, uh, a high rep reproducible platform, um, we're also able to generate uh, yeah, a good assay window, but also a really good rep reproducibility there as well. And then finally on the right, we can combine different readouts so we can, uh, of course, you use uh, different markers like the alpha, as you may mentioned before. We're also mentioning a soluble biomarker called CDChat, so that's a tissue connective growth factor, which was mentioned before as well. Um, so that's something that we would measure in the supernatant. Um, but then we're also able to, to measure uh, um, uh, hepatocyte functionality. So in this case, we measure albumin. We measure general uh, cell toxicity uh, by measuring RDH. And then I think unique to these platforms, we're all, also able to assess uh, um, vascular uh, morphology as well. So we're able to, to measure the amount of vascular junctions, but also like the health of the vascular network that is formed. Um, and that also allows us to really distinguish effects, uh, to, to distinguish um, uh, mechanisms that maybe would target the vasculature or would target the stellate cells or would target the hepatocytes. So we're able to discriminate uh, a lot of different mechanisms using using this setup. So that this will hopefully allow us to uh, get a better insight in the mechanisms that play a role during the uh, during liver fibrosis, and maybe find novel targets that uh, also. Um, um, yeah, target target mesh via a different uh, different approach. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude this uh, this presentation. Happy to take any questions. Uh, just put them in the the, the chat or uh, just answer the uh, uh, ask them right now. Um, and yeah, thank you for your attention. In the co culture three D slash organoid, how did you localize macrophage with PAHH and endothelial cells? Um, so actually, we have a few different approaches to to achieve this. So if we go back to this slide, um, we can integrate the, the immune cells via the vasculature. I think that would, would be one of the most um, straightforward, forward, but also one of the most exciting ways to add immune cells in this case uh, by perfusing the system with immune cells, and hopefully they they would integrate and extravasate into into the culture, as you would see here. Another way of integrating immune cells or macrophages would be by mixing them or embed them inside the, the, the extracellular matrix while, while, building your, uh, while building your tissue. It's an approach, I think both approaches work, uh, but I'm, so personally I'm, I'm the most excited by, by taking the, the, the approach of, of providing immune cells via the vasculature, because that also allows us to integrate uh, different types of immune cells um, and, and hopefully that will, uh, yeah lead to some uh, some exciting new models. Hi, and first of all, thank you for having for letting me um, give them, providing this opportunity today to present this slide to you. So for those who are not familiar with new cells, we're a, um, a biotech company that's based in the northeast of the of the UK. Uh, we currently operate in three different platform areas. We have a retinal platform, a kidney platform and a lung platform. And it's the lung platform that I'm going to focus on today. Um, with regards to the lung platform, we have a specific interest in lung fibrosis. And the way that we, we are building our lung platform here at, here at New Cells is to use relatively simple models initially to, to better understand the, in, the, um, the cell types individually before we begin to put those together in more complex formats such as um, core culture systems. So what I'm going to speak to you today about is one of our assays that we've launched recently, and that's our five blast to myo five blast transition assay, which runs alongside um, our other commercial platform, which is the small airway epithelial cells that we have lot recently launched, and our development projects all feed into these two platforms to help us build more complex microphysiological systems. So I'm sure many people are familiar with lung fibrosis, um, and lung fibrosis is of course. Um, occurs due to the excessive deposition of extracellular matrix proteins within the lung. Um, a common type of lung fibrosis is idiopathic lung fibrosis. And while the exact etiology of IPF is currently unknown, it's believed that this disease occurs due to a recurrent, direct, recurrent um, epithelial damage within the lower airways. This recurrent epithelial damage causes a release of different cytokines, which then activate fibroblasts and induce a transition of um, somewhat quiescent fibroblasts into an activated state known as fibroblast to myofibroblast transition. And this results in the excessive secretion and dep deposition of extracellular matrix proteins, 
and an ongoing aberrant repair pro process. This ongoing aberrant re repair process and that excessive, excessive extracellular matrix deposition results, to, re results in um, scarring of the lung tissue and a stiffing of the lung tissue, um, leading to a poor prognosis for lung fibrosis patients. There are currently only two approved therapeutics um, for the treatment of lung fibrosis, as I'm sure many people are aware, and um, that's perfenidib, perfenidone and nintedanib. Um, so it's, there's a significant unmet need out there to um, identify new therapeutic agents um, for the treatment of lung fibrosis. And we believe that our um, FMT, high throughput FMT assay serves as a, a nice starting point to screen some of these potential antitherapeutic, antifibrotic therapeutics. So our assay, um, as I mentioned, it's a fibroblast to myofibroblast transition assay. And for this assay, we use primary human fibroblasts. We currently have three very well validated human lung fibroblast donors available to us in house. And we've recently added to that um, to the number of donors and we, with the two additional healthy donors. And we also have some IPF fibroblast donors, too. We use um, TGF beta as our stimulus. Um, this is a secreted cytokine and is well known to be a key driver of fibrosis progression and promotes the activation of fibroblasts and that differentiation from a fibroblast into a myofibroblast. So, the way in which we set up our assay is we seed our fibroblasts into high throughput 384 well plates and we pre treat with the test compounds. Following this pre treatment, um, we stimulate with TGF beta in our assay media, and our assay media actually includes um, something called a macromolecular crowding agent, which I'll touch on a little bit later in the talk. This, the, we then see the fibroblast transition through pre, a pre-activated state into a myofibroblast-like state. And at this point, we can see a nice increase in the ex expression and deposition of extracellular matrix, such as collagen one, and we're able to detect alpha smooth muscle actin using immunocytochemistry. And we see nice robust assay windows for both of these two measurements. So when we first looked to set up the FMT assay at New Cells, um, the idea was that this would provide us a nice stepping stone um, to develop more complex fibrosis models. But what we actually realized was that setting up this assay was a lot more complex than we initially believed it would be. Um, it was a lot of the smaller problems, a lot of the smaller intricacies of the assay that we hadn't actually considered in too much detail before setting it before proceeding with the assay. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how we validated the assay in-house and some of the work that has had to go into this to develop us a nice, to give us a nice validated, robust and reproducible assay. Um, so we want, we obviously wanted to use automization for the setup of the assay. Particularly, we wanted to introduce an automated washing of the cell culture plates during the immunocytochemical detection phase. Um, However, we did notice that when we started using this automated washing, we were seeing significant cell detachment. And you can see this here in the image. If you look at coating one, you can actually see the fibroblasts are detaching quite readily from, um, from the individual wells. And this led to a high level of variability between the different assay wells. So we did some work looking at different potential coatings of the plates. And we ended up with um, what we're now, what we can see here as coating two. And you can see here that this greatly reduced that um, detachment of the cells from the plate. We're promoting cell ad adherence. And this gives a nice, a nice increase in the assay robustness as we progress forward. Importantly, what we did notice is that the actual coating of the of the wells didn't affect the overall protein expression. It was mainly affecting the cell adherence here. Um, to promote fibroblast activation. We, we did some work looking at the media composition. So one of those factors that we initially focused on was the serum concentration of the media. So fibroblasts are normally cultured in um, a 2% serum media, and this allows them to proliferate in culture. In our assay, we wanted to reduce that proliferation and promote the activation upon stimulation with TGF-beta. So by reducing that serum concentration to 0.5% serum, you can see here um, in the the quantification of EDU incorporation in our fibroblasts that we see a, a significant reduction in EDU positive cells. And what we did actually see is a nice increase in cellular activation, in fibroblast activation, sorry, as measured by alpha smooth muscle actin and collagen one deposition. Um, this also allows us to control for cell number. Whilst we normalize all of our protein expression to total cell count within the assay, we felt that by controlling for cell number, it allows us to better 
um, investigate any differences in the expression of key proteins that we're interested in and discount any changes in cell number as being the contributing factor to this. So a little bit more work that we did on the media composition. We noticed that when we were running the assay, we were developing, we were seeing a nice quantifiable increase in smooth muscle actin and in what we've got here is total collagen one. We also look at extracellular collagen one measures as well. Um, but we did see quite a lot of variation with this. So again, we came back to um, the asset culture media that we're using and looked to optimize this a little bit further. And to do this, we looked at um, playing around with some of the components that were in the media and adjusting the concentrations of those components such that we we developed a nice robust assay window to give us a nice assay window in which we can test potential and therapeutic compounds. So you can see here with the different types of media, we do see a significant increase in, in the expression of alpha smooth muscle actin with the different media types and also in the expression of total collagen 1, 2. The third way in which we looked to optimise this assay was the introduction of what we call what, of a macromolecular crowder. Um, so our macromolecular crowder, it's an inert molecule which we add to each individual well. And the way we like to think about this is that the macromolecular crowder basically puts a lid on top of the cells. So you can imagine we have the fibroblasts sat on the bottom of the plate. And when we stimulate with TGF beta, they start to secrete extracellular matrix proteins into the open space above those cells. By adding the macromolecular crowder, it actually forces those proteins to sit down and we see that they're deposited nicely onto the bottom of the plate. And you can see this um, represented in the images that we've got on the slide here. So if we look at the top images, we have total, total collagen one. And you can actually see um, that there's not too, too much of a change in the absence and the presence of a macromolecular crowder. But actually, if we start to look at extracellular matrix protein deposition, you can see that we do see an increase in the deposition of the, the extracellular collagen one protein. So we believe that by adding this macromolecular crowder, it provides a more physiologically relevant way to study the effects of extracellular matrix proteins in fibrosis. So we do this in high throughput format. We use 384 well um, assay plates. And that obviously allows us to screen multiple compounds, uh, either single or uh, sing, uh, a single dose, or we can provide, produce um, dose full dose response curves for different agents. Um, so you can see here, this is how we analyze and quantify our data. So we use segmental analysis with our high content imaging. And we spent some work really refining these segmental analysis masks to allow us to pick up those intricacies that we see in the changes um, following TGF beta stimulation. So you can see here the nuclei are quite easily detect detectable. The smooth muscle actin, what we do see in this assay, is we see a diffuse expression of smooth muscle actin throughout the fibroblast site, throughout the cytoplasm of the fibroblast. But upon stimulation with TGF beta, we actually see a recruitment of that smooth muscle actin into the um, cellular stress fibers to give us a nice striated appearance. So we really did some work looking at segmental analysis mass so we could pick up those fine stripe, uh, fine, um, those fine fibers within the cells. Similarly with collagen one, as you can imagine, when we're looking at extracellular collagen one expression, we see that the um, collagen one fibrils are deposited onto the cell and we did some work with the analysis max. And you can see clearly, if you look at the analysis masks here for smooth muscle actin and for collagen one, there's a significant increase in the expression there in the presence of TGF beta. So looking at some quantification data here, we've performed, um, we validated the assay using a TGF beta dose response. So you can see here when we increase that TGF beta um, TGF beta concentration, we see a nice dose dependent increase in the expression of smooth muscle actin. And similarly, we do see a nice dose dependent increase in extracellular collagen 1, 2. We also see um, a robust change in a dose dependent manner with total collagen 1. And the difference there is that we permeabilize the cells to measure the total collagen 1. Um, and a nice control compound that we have for this, the assays are the ALK receptor inhibitors. So here we've used SB431542 and SB525334. And you can see that we see a nice dose dependent decrease in the expression of collagen 1. And we also see this for smooth muscle actin as well. So we really believe that our assay provides a really high level of sensitivity to provide confident results for um, antifibrotic, for the study of antifibrotic therapeutic agents. 
So once we've launched the asset um, recently, what we are looking to now do is how can we expand our asset to make this more physiologically relevant? Obviously, with the assay itself, we can take those supernatants um, we, and do ELISA analysis for different uh, fibrotic factors, which have been mentioned in some of the other talks here today. We've also seen nice robust changes in RNA expression, but we're really interested in looking at the quantification of fibrotic proteins. Um, and we're actually able to multiplex up to six different channels here at new cells. And something we're working on is developing a nice, a complex um, immunocytochemic chemistry protocol where we can detect different fibrotic proteins. So here we've got our standard alpha smooth muscle actin and collagen one proteins. And we've introduced into the mix this um, this splice variant of fibronectin known as EDA fibronectin, which is commonly associated with the fibronectin. So we're starting to build a more complex model here where we can really look at a multitude of different extracellular matrix proteins and there, which we know directly affect and this is work which is going on in development um, and we're constantly trying to think of new ways to study fibrosis. The next steps for us would be to add in these um, different proteins, but also to look at building more complex models. So thinking about co-culture systems with um, epithelial cells and how we can really utilise um, these different types of assays to better understand the mechanisms and study any potential antifibrotic compounds. So just to summarise, our um, FMT assay is a validated high content FMT assay. Um, it's high throughput assay for the study of fibroblast activation and collagen expression and deposition. Um, generally on a plate, we would expect to run five different test articles in a seven point dose response. Um, our, a lot of our assay validation work we initially did in an immortalised lung fibroblast cell line, but we have now transitioned to using those primary human healthy um, lung fibroblasts, um, which will give us a better and more physiological readout. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we do also have now those idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis fibroblasts as well. We use the disease ambulant stimulus of TGF beta, and we're able to measure the relevant markers within the the cells and within the extracellular compartment. And when you see nice, robust um, induced induction of alpha smooth muscle actin and collagen one following stimulation with TGF beta, whilst we control for the measurement of cell number and the assessment of proliferative capacity. And we have validated experimental assay controls, which are included on each plate. So we use the control compounds and the ALK5 inhibitors. And we've also tested the IPF approved compounds, nintetinib and phenidone, in this assay as well. And um, so with that, I'll just um, I'd just like to thank everybody for the who's contributed to this work at New Cells. It's quite a large team. Um, and as you can imagine, it, it took quite a lot of work to do this validation, to do the assay validation and the assay setup. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them now or if you just drop them into the chat. So welcome, everyone. Um, here I take the opportunity to present to you our interstitial lung disease model on a chip, a platform to test efficacy of new clinical drug candidates for lung fibrosis. First, a couple of words about Alveolix. We are a small company um, located in Switzerland. We aim bringing um, molecules faster to the patient by reducing animal experiment in the preclinical phase and also improve preclinical decision make making. Um, and when we look into the future, of course, we are also aiming at bringing individual and preventive therapy um, to the patient through personalized medicine. We aim to do so by combining biology and engineering and taking the best of two worlds, uh, we developed the AX barrier on chip system. The AX barrier, uh, on, AX barrier on chip system is um, composed of four parts. So here, the heart of the system is the AX12. That's where the cells are, cells are located. The AX12 is connected to the AX dock, to the two electrochromatical parts, the AX exchanger and the actuator. The exchanger, as the name already um, suggests, is here to exchange medium and maintain the cells, while the AX actuator um, brings the 3D cyclic stretch to the cells. Couple more words to the AX12. It is um, composed of a 96-well 
plate format and each plate has 12 independent units. Each unit is composed of an inlet well, a cell well and an outlet well. The inlet and the outlet well are connected through a fluidic chamber on the bottom of the plate and can be um, controlled through microfluidic channels. In the cell well, in the middle in gray here, we have a porous, thin, flexible membrane, which allows um, the stretch, uh, the stretching of cells. Um, and thanks to its thinness and uh, the pores in the membrane, it allows close cell proximity and cell-cell crosstalk. So here we have an example of epithelial um, endothelial co-culture. Now I've been talking about C3D cycling stretch. So how does the stretch get to the cells? Um, as you can see here, we have a cavity on the bottom of the plate. This cavity is covered with a thin, um, a thin membrane to which you can apply negative pressure. And this downwards movement gets then um, translated to the cell, to the membrane where the cells are located, as you can see here. And if the movie is working, unfortunately it's not, uh, we could see um, a breathing distal lung. Um, advantage of the AX Barium chip technology is here I um, explained the example of the lung, but you can use it for all barrier um, forming organs, such as for instance also the gut, um, where we also have a model on um, at the moment. So um, on the barium chip technology, you can um, adjust the frequency of the stretch as well as also direction. So you can have unidirectional or bidirectional um, strain. Now back to the lung, um, to our interstitial lung disease model. So interstitial lung disease is an umbrella term for um, a multitude of diseases. Here we will focus on lung fibrosis, so um, a disease on the distal lung. Uh, this disease is um, affecting patients where um, the disease progresses and due to the stiffening and the thickening of the interstitial um, space, the patient has more and more issues to breathe and will, if you think about um, IPF, uh, have a life prognosis of two to five years. And there is no cure on the market. As you have already heard, there are two um, potential treatments that you can have, so periphery donor and internet, but both of them are only slowing down the disease. Um, hallmarks of the disease is aberrant bond healing, so um, increased ECM deposition, as well as epithelial mesenchymal transition. Um, and fibroblast activation, so fibroblast transition into myofibroblast. So, um, as I already said, there are no treatments available. Therefore, uh, there is a dire need for a platform um, to check for new clinical um, candidates. And here I would like to introduce a model, a possibility of how to do so. So, we use um, a co culture of patient derived primary alveolar epithelial cells and healthy primary human lung fibroblast. Um, in the co culture, um, we introduce fibrotic uh, hallmarks using TGF beta 1, so um, a driver for lung fibrosis, and compare um, the outcome to a vehicle control. Here, I would like to show you um, the quality control we do before we start the treatment. As you can see, the model builds a nice tight barrier over time, and at day zero, when the barrier is stable, we start the treatment of the co-culture. Now to the model development. So first, you look at protein expression. You will always see on top um, the protein expressed by the epithelial cells and on the bottom from the fibroblast. In gray, you see the vehicle, and in blue, um, the TGF beta and treated cells. And as you can see here, um, protein expression of collagen 4, so an important hallmark for lung fibrosis and the ECM deposition, that they get increased up on TGF beta stimulation. And this you can also appreciate here in the immunofluorescence. Uh, imaging where the vehicle control expresses less collagen 1 than when we stimulate the cell with TGF beta. You can also see that ZO1, so a tight function protein of the epithelial cells, um, is present in both, um, in both conditions. 
Now that we know that we have important hallmarks expressed when we um, stimulate our cells with TGF beta 1, uh, we included um, the drug nintetanib uh, at different concentrations uh, to check if we could slow down or even reverse um, lung fibrosis in our model. First, we look at uh, um, gene expression. Here again, the important hallmark of ECM deposition. Here we will look at collagen 1 for um, expression for epithelial and fibroblast cells. And as expected, we see an upregulation of collagen 1. And when we then introduce nintadanib to the system, so here from left to right, you have an increased dose of nintadanib. You see um, that the drug reverses the effect of the tgf beta trigger. When we look at the tissue remodeling factor, CCN2, so it's encoding the protein CTGF, uh, which is driving uh, fibroblast proliferation, we see again, as expected, that this gene gets upregulated up on TGF beta treatment. And when we introduce Nintanip, we see again um, a decrease of this hallmark. Um, actually, it's brought down to a normal level compared to the vehicle control. When we look at another important hallmark, so here uh, EMT marker CDH2, which is encoding the protein um, and cadherin, and for the fibroblast, the genes ACTA2, which is encoding the protein alpha SMA, as we have heard before. Also, these two markers are upregulated up on TGF beta stimulation, and when we introduce nintanib to the system, we can again reverse the effect. Now we confirmed what we have seen in um, gene expression in protein expression here for pro-collagen 1 and fibronectin. And um, again, we see an upregulation when we introduce TGF beta to the, uh, to the system, and we could reverse, reverse the effect of an nitidonib introduction into the system. Um, another important uh, marker to look at are diagnostics markers. So here we have IL-6 and TIMP-1, which are both markers that can be tested um, in the serum of patients. And as expected, both markers are upregulated upon TGF beta stimulation. And when we introduce nitidonib, these markers are, are downregulated again. And here, um, lastly, we'll look at the tissue remodeling factor, PI-1, which is again uh, upregulated up on TGF beta stimulation as expected. And again, nitidanib could reverse that effect. Now that we have a model where we see that we can introduce um, lung fibrosis hallmarkers and we can also reverse, or we have a benchmarker, uh, nitidanib, to actually validate the, the model. We added a referent compound that was kindly provided by Jessica Marcini from, from um, KSC Pharmaceutical. Um, so we tested again Nintanip um, and then added also the referent compound um, to the cells as well. We know that the referent compound um, does, um, the referent compound is acting on the epithelial cells. Um, it has a potential antifibrotic um, effect. And to test then this molecule, um, we first actually checked, sorry, we checked barrier integrity. So we see that when we have the vehicle, uh, we have a nice barrier at the end of our experiment. And when we introduce TGF beta, the barrier is still stable. When we check nintadanib, we say, see that um, overall the barrier integrity stays stable. And when we add the reference compound to the system, you see here that uh, this compound actually is acting on the epithelial cells and is um, reducing the barrier integrity. We then looked at bright field images of the epithelial cells. And as you can see um, in all conditions, so the vehicle control, the TGF beta, an internet at the highest concentration and the reference compound for all conditions, the cells are still there and have a nice um, confluent layer, even though we saw a barrier breakdown for the reference compound. Now, of course, we are also interested in the antifibrotic um, effect of the reference compound. So, of course, uh, we again introduced TGF beta into the system 
as you can see here, and as expected, we saw an upregulation of the collagen 1 protein, and when we introduced it to the NIP, uh, we reversed this effect. Now, looking at the reference compound, we see that the effect of TGF beta um, could be reversed very nicely in a dose dependent manner. And looking at the fibroblasts, we see that, um, or it's striking that when we look at the, the, the NIP condition, that the fibroblasts are morphologically very different compared to the other conditions, and that the cell density is much lower. So uh, to conclude, uh, I hope I could convince you that in our interstitial lung disease model, we can um, show that we have key hallmarks of lung fibrosis when we introduce the fibrosis driver TGF-beta. Additionally, uh, we validated our model using the FDA-approved drug Nintedanib. And and I would at this point also like to say that our model is commercially available and it's also customizable. Unfortunately, due to time, I did not, I could not show you um, how you could also um, switch cells. So for instance, instead of using normal human lung fibroblast, you could use deceased human lung fibroblast if that's of interest for you. Um, and for the application, you can use this model um, to look at mechanism of action for different interstitial lung diseases, for instance, as I showed you for lung fibrosis. This model can be used for efficacy testing, and I have not shown it here, but of course this model we could also use for safety and toxicity assessment. With this, I would like to thank you all for your attention from the whole team, um, and a very special thanks to Nuria Roldan, from PETA Science Consortium International, who has been um, formerly employed by Alveolix and was heavily involved in this project. And of course, also big thanks to Jessica Machin from KSC. So I do see here a question here uh, from new cell or for new cells that I don't think we got to after the presentation. Um, the question is, what is MMC in the new cells lung fibroblast platform? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, hi, sorry, I'm just stepping in for Megan there. Um, so yeah, the MMC is our macromolecular crowder, crowder that we use um, in our media, but unfortunately we're not really allowed to disclose what that is at this point. Great, thank you, Fiona. Um, and there's another question that I'm not sure who exactly it was for. It might also have been for new cells based on the timing. Um, but the question is, what are the age ranges of the donors used in your experiments? Uh, yes, do you want, is it for new cells? Um, yeah, I think potentially either new cells or, um, I'll, I'll just let you go ahead, Fiona, and then maybe if others uh, also have an answer for this question, then then they're welcome to chime in. Yes, yeah, so the age ranges are between about 40 to 80, I think in the 80s is the oldest donor that we have. Um, and we've tried to match all of our donors to the donors that we use for the small airway epithelial cell model that we have. So they're matched as closely as we can in terms of age, race and sex. Great. Awesome. Um... Okay, we have a question for everyone. Um, so I'll just say the question and then I'll just call on everyone one at a time. Uh, so the question is, how critical is the role of transcriptomics for getting mechanistic insight for fibrosis? Would it get important moving forward? Or I think potentially would it become important or more important moving forward? Um, so maybe I'll just start with uh, just kind of in order from the talks that we heard today. Uh, so Jacob, if you want to start with that question. Yeah, sure. We don't do a huge amount of fibrosis work, but I can speak to it a little bit because um, my PhD work was in regeneration of muscle. And certainly in muscle, fibrosis occurs because of a complex interaction of multiple cell types. And so 
especially single cell fibrosis can be really nice for beginning, at least beginning to unpick how the interactions occur. Uh, one of the challenges I think it is that we face and is the cost limits to some extent how many samples people are willing to do. And so, especially in muscle where you've got a really temporal response and you want to look across time, those studies can really blow quickly. Um, but there's definitely value in it, especially I think in single cell, um, single cell work. If you can get single cells out of your model, that's also sometimes a challenge. Great. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, James, over to you. Yeah, um, so transcript, transcriptomics is again a biomarker uh, system that is using, you know, extrapolating that biomarker for function. What we really try and do is to measure function. So for our fibrotic models, we would use for muscle, for cardiac, and ones we are developing for lung, what we try to do is to do function directly. So we don't have to rely upon the biomarker extrapolation. Um, however, transcri transcriptomics is certainly a nice confirmatory uh, microbiology marker for the function that we're trying to achieve. And we will do that on occasion if we're trying to, again, drill down into mechanism as the, uh, the question is being, uh, has been asked. Great. Thanks, James. Uh, Roberta. Yeah, I agree. And uh, also, I would say that uh, I think so the, the beauty of also of uh, this microphysiological system is the fact that, uh, uh, for instance, in our case, we can also retrieve cells so we can dig uh, a little bit more into the mechanism of activation. In our case, for example, it's really also useful to really assess uh, which is the effect of the mechanical stimulation which is the main driver that we use uh, to develop our fibrotic model so of course this is uh, another way to test uh, our hypothesis and it's uh, uh, really nice uh, to be implemented in the platform and it's compatible great thanks roberta uh, oliver anything to add yeah, i think it's important i mean a lot of our work um, looks at key pcr but um we're always trying to sort of relate, as James said, you know, your, your your protein work back to sort of the gene expression and see if there's a mismatch there. But certainly with being able to look at ELISA's or ICC, it's important to look at transcriptomics going forward and make sure they're all sort of in unison with how they're showing up, I guess. Great. Thanks. Uh, Madhu. Oh, yes, uh, terrific insights um, shared by everyone here. I think not a whole lot to add, except that I think from a mechanism of action point, when we when we look at specific donors, I think being able to look then at the transcriptomics data for differential responses is um, is very informative. Yeah, great, thank you, uh, Vincent. Yes, um, I hope you're able to hear me. I just put on my headset. Yep. Um, what I'd like to add there maybe is um, I think for us it will be really crucial to understand the contribution of the, the liver and the telio as we uh, as we culture in our platform. So therefore, the, the single cell uh, transcriptomics will be really useful to uh, to apply there. Um, and also, what we're also currently exploring is the use of uh, spatial transcriptomics as well, um, and that will be also insightful to also to st to study the. Um, difference within the culture itself, because I can expect that some regions might be more hypoxic than others, uh, and, and techniques like space transcriptomics will really allow us to, to, to study that as well. Great, thanks, Vincent. Uh, Fiona. Hi, uh, yeah, I mean, similar to what everybody else has said, really, um, transcriptomics is a useful tool, especially if you get it on a single um, cell basis in a more complex model. Also, I'd maybe argue that something like proteomics, if used in combination, would also be quite helpful um, to be able to see like the exact proteins that are um, being expressed and uh, differentially expressed within fibrosis or potential treatments. Great, thanks. And lastly, Leah, anything additional to add? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think I have anything to add. Of course, it's always depending on the question. And as has been said, yeah, it's a nice tool, but only one tool of many. So also proteinomics would be important, of course. Great. Thanks, Leah. 
Um, just popping over to the Q&A, there is a question for Insphero, um, Madhu. The question is, can the li complex liver model be offered as a product, not just services? Yes, absolutely. In fact, it is offered as a product um, as well. So uh, depending on you know whether you want to do sort of the multiplex responses that we do or do it on your own, um, it, it can be offered as a product. Great, thanks. Um, there is a question in the chat that I think is for everyone. Um, so I'll I'll read the question aloud and then maybe um, whoever is interested in answering, you can just turn on your mic. Um, so the question is, most lung fibrosis in patients is long and is a long and chronic process, but presented experimental lung fibrosis models seem to be relative, relatively short time to be developed. What do you think about the time gap between MPS model and real patient? Can we ignore this or should we try to develop another chronic model or other chronic models? Um, yeah, I can so, kind of address that yeah. one if that's all right. Because I will do it more generally in that for all the MPS models, we figured out ways where you can accelerate the effect. I mean, we see ALS phenotypes within a month of culture where it takes 30, 40 years to be able to see that in patients. So there are methods to be able to accelerate um, the, um, you know, the, the phenotype uh, degradation uh, uh, with time. So I think there are ways you can do that. However, I do believe that there are benefit for looking at acute versus chronic, where even if chronic is only 14 days versus acute, um, you can get a lot of information from that. But it depends upon the tissue, but there are ways of accelerating that um, degradation or that disease phenotype in MPS systems. Yeah, thanks so much, James. Great points. Uh, anyone else want to chime in on that question? I mean, I think you know James has touched on it there, and I'm sure the others can say as much. But a lot of these systems, you can actually you know grow your tissues of interest for longer. So we often talk about 14 days, but most people go up to 28. It's just about you know what's the what's the question you need answering, and if it's about chronic disease, and it's about drug treatment, then it doesn't necessarily need to be ongoing. It can just be within a 14 day window or a 28 day window. So, you know, while we can sort of push the systems and we can see how long we can grow it for, it costs money and it's trying to answer a relevant question or at least keep costs to a minimum and uh, be, be pleased with the data that you've got. But yeah, yeah there's definitely, that, there's, there's pros and cons to, to, to different models, I guess. Yeah, Oliver is absolutely correct. It's a cost benefit analysis, right? Because you give them a cost for a 28 day or a a 45 day experiment versus a 14 and suddenly everybody wants to do a 14 day experiment or can you do a seven day experiment? <laughs> I'm sorry if I can just add something on top of this. I think it's really important also to consider the kind of cells that we are using to develop the MPS. So sometimes we use already pathological cells and maybe the time can be accelerated. Other, uh, for other approaches, uh, we can start from uh, physiological cells and transfer them into pathological one. So we should take into account also this. Not only that, but also the effect of the compound. So we can tailor and we need some time to tailor uh, the time of the culture based on the kind of effect that we want to, to see. Uh, from the type of drug uh, or uh, therapeutics that we are uh, inserting in the model. Yeah, thanks, Roberta. Great points. Um, there is just another question here uh, for anyone. Do you incorporate machine learning into your data analysis? If so, what programs or methods do you use? We do. Um, I think you almost have to at this point due to the large data sets. Um, we build most of our systems in-house. Great, thanks, James. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Yeah, I'd second what James is saying. We do the same. Uh, we have um, we have some collaborators that we're working with um, on the on our daily models where we're developing predictive algorithms. Thanks, Madhu.
Okay, I think we just have, well, maybe this will be our last question, just looking at the time. Um, so this question is for alveolic specifically. What are the benefits you've observed for your dynamic model versus static model for modeling IPF? Thank you for the question. So generally know that um, dynamics is important for IPF. It has been shown in literature. And uh, we know generally that in the st dynamic settings, um, our models are um, in a more physiological range. And also when we look, for instance, at what you have shown on the distal lung or also in the gut, they show um, more um, sensitivity. So um, overall, I would say these benefits. Great, thank you so much, Leah. Um, so it looks like those are the last questions that were unanswered in the chat and Q&A. Um, so I just wanted to extend a huge thank you to all of you um, for speaking at this event today. It was fantastic to hear all of your talks. Um, and I think the uh, attendees would say the same. Um, so I will be sending out this event recording uh, to anyone who registered as well as contact information to all of our speakers today. Um, so you can reach out to them with any additional questions or to myself. Uh, my email is in the chat. Um, if you want have any additional questions you want passed along. Um, but that will conclude our webinar for today. So thank you again to all of our speakers um, and keep an eye on your email for the event recording. Thank I, you so